Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Happy Thursday morning, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. We are continuing on our 2024 theme of simple operational practices in businesses. And to talk about that topic, we got one of the best of the best CEO of AppSumo, Noah Kagan. You can check him out on YouTube as well. He's got over a million subscribers and he is the author of the upcoming book, Million Dollar Weekend. This book comes out in just a few days. You can go pre-order your copy online right now. It's an incredible book. Actually, he co-wrote it with Tal Raz, who also wrote a couple books featured on the show in the past, including Never Split the Difference. So check out Million Dollar Weekend. I actually sat in the office with Noah this summer as he was working on it. There's so many details in here, specifically if you're starting a new product, if you're starting a new business or a side business, or you want to keep things simple for your team. I think Million Dollar Weekend, I mean, there's literally like emails in here. It's broken down how to launch a new product, how to get a new idea. Super cool book. So check it out. In today's conversation, we spoke more about how to operate at scale, something Noah does every day. We talked about his 7% growth goal this year and why he set it there versus 20% and how that can affect the whole team. We talk about some specific processes around leadership, talk about how to manage team members. And the cool thing is, is everything we talk about in this episode, none of it costs money, right? These are all simple tools, but I think the art and the power is in how you apply the concepts. So hopefully today's conversation will inspire you to install one new process in your business that will make it just that much more powerful this week and will keep that momentum going through 2024. What I'm curious about behind the scenes is, I just want to ask you some simple questions about how you run AppSumo, please. And specifically, I'm thinking about like quarterly and annual diagnostic questions in different categories. And so the first question is this, how do you guys set goals? Are goals what you start with when you think about Hmm. thinking about a company? I think goals can trip you up if you started too soon. Like, hey, I want to make a million dollars this year. And it's like, have you made any dollars? No. So you you don't even know how you're going to perform. So why don't you get some base data before you make that decision? Because maybe you should be at 2 million. Maybe you should be at a half a million. With AppSumo early on, I think you really need to start with what's the core of the business. And the core of the business is the problem, which is, can we promote software deals for entrepreneurs? That's the core. I would say what we did very early on, and we still do this day, is like, what's the one goal this year? That's never changed. So early on, the first year's goal was 100,000 email subscribers. Because the idea there is like, what's the goal that leads all other goals? So you could even argue today, if AppSumo really only had one goal, if we only had to do one thing, it's like, how many deals a month would we do? And then that subsequently kind of can inspire like, all right, how much revenue does a deal make? Okay, well, that would be our revenue goal. But really, it's just get 33 deals a month and we'll have a successful business. So is that how you guys discuss goals in your annual meetings? We've decided that our main goal for the past... Now it's the second year, not we changed it, is net revenue. So we, five years ago, started just doing gross sales as the main goal. But the problem with gross sales is it includes refunds. Yeah. It includes credits. And then it's like, you could actually have a really high gross sales. So like last year, we had $80 million in gross sales. Net revenue was 53 million. Wow. 27 or 25 million in refunds and credits, right? Because we have a 60 day refund policy. So it sounds cool, but reality what's real in terms of like how the business is performing. So two years so ago- that's a decision you made. Yeah, so two years ago, we shifted from gross revenue to net revenue as like the number one goal in the business. We don't really have a three-year target. We have a three-year vision, but we didn't set like in three years, we want to be a hundred million dollars. Personally, that just doesn't motivate me. And I think that's important to think about it. Like, are you excited about your goal? Our goal this year is 56.6 million. Last year was 45. Am I excited about it? Not really. It doesn't really make a difference to me. I want to set our goal. I don't, do we need to surpass it? Not necessarily. 
I'm more excited actually about how we're operating the business. But I do find a helpful direction to have one destination that we're all moving towards. For me, it's like, are deals dope? Do I like the products on AppSumo personally? Are, am I excited about the originals products like Tidy Cow and that we're working on a, a DocuSign alternative? So you can have one price forever DocuSign product. We're working on like other things that I'm just like, I just love what we're doing. Yes, I like the base foundation to still hit the goal. And then those goals then have sub goals. Right, supporting goals. So the way we've broken it down is you have your like main goal and then you have kind of like, what are the core KPIs? So there's core KPIs and then there's like secondary KPIs. And I, I think the thing I would recommend for people out there is that don't worry about how we do it. <laughs> this is 14 years in the making and in the next 14 years, it might be different. Right. But I think the core thing that I would recommend is like, you have one goal. What are the, like the highest level things that really change that goal? So for instance, we set a goal of 45 million last year and you can break that goal into really three things. How much traffic do we get? How many people buy? How much do they spend? Traffic yeah. times conversion times average spend is our revenue, right? So then, okay, well, who owns each of those three things, right? And then you make sure that there's three owners for the clear goals. And those people need to be the most talented people in your company. I hope so. Thank God willing. <laughs> you know, but here's what's interesting. So our goal last year was 45. I think we ended at 53.3. And so Sean, who runs our head of revenue, he did modeling and was like, all right, well, based on 45, we could do 10% growth, give or take, and we'll end up at 55, 56. But we ended at 53. So we go to the board and I think everyone should have some form of a board, uh, which is more just like accountability and like strategic outsiderness. And the board is like, all right, so you finish at 53 and you're going to try to do 56. Like way to be very unambitious. And that was a moment where I had to really think about what kind of business do I want to be a part of? What kind of business do I want to lead? And I've noticed over the years, and I've gotten more sustainable and more about compounding wins versus sprints. Like this book is a sprint. Even though I've worked in it four years in the marketing, I've been doing it for nine months. This last month is a sprint. But I think in business, how do you sprint and sustain a sprint over a decade or two decades? And so with AppSumo, even though the board was like, you guys should try to get to 100 million in three years. I was like, I, I don't, doesn't do shit for me, right? I'm already making more than enough money. I'm really happy with that. Team seems to be pretty, really content with how we're operating. I like the idea of like less aggressive goals, but then we can kind of like keep improving it each year. And so it gives us more creative freedom throughout the year. And then I will say, seeing the team each month be like, crush our goal this month, crush our goal this month, crush our goal this month. It doesn't build full resilience. So if we have some challenges, but it builds confidence and excitement to be a part of a winning team. You mentioned that you're winning. We're winning every day. Achievable goals. I mean, you can set a winning habit in a company by having goals be achievable. And that doesn't mean you can't be experimenting with upside opportunities. So while we have achievable goals that are, you know, I think a 7% growth rate from actuals to where we are this year, it creates space where, yeah, you just still have to improve things at least 7%. Yeah. But it's like you can improve your, our affiliates. Like we're doing video ambassadors or we're doing partner marketing or we can improve our Google ads a little bit better. But 7% is pretty doable. What that means though is that then we have space to try like on the side experiments that could be a 10x. Do something crazier. Yeah, because we're not worrying about every day having to do something crazy. Yeah. I love that. So yeah, some of the 10X experiments are like, we were going to buy like a product competitor, but they wanted like $2 million. And we're like, we could literally build you in a month. So we're building it in a month. <laughs> and then we're going to market it and see how that goes. But the idea is like, we want to keep promoting software tools for entrepreneurs. So that's a way to get people at the top of the funnel. And then we had an idea for how do we give more people affiliate market, like empowering software creators, who is our customer and our hero to have their own marketing. So right. So either at the beginning, if they want to do a deal or if they want to have their own marketing tools to promote themselves. I love this concept of the goals being like less anxiety inducing because I think I came from a school where it's like, it's always better to have this big thing. Everyone is, yeah. And then the problem is, is like I even saw between Ian and I, it would create anxiety. Like we couldn't answer how to solve the goals. Yeah. So there'd just be like this downstream of everybody being like, oh, I don't know, we're just going to do a bunch of stuff. And, and there, there's some greatness in that. We're like, we got to be creative and we got to try something out. But like what I've noticed is to do that year after year, right, after year is exhausting. And at a certain point, if you're running the company as an executive, it's like you can't even define how to get there. Like you just gave very clear dials. Here's the three dials. And then break those down per group. So yeah. Like the engineering team has conversion rate. Nick and me and the marketing team have traffic. And then average order value is kind of the BD team to make sure the average order of the deals with the way the price points are doesn't go too low. Right. But it does create opportunity. People will say, well, like, how do you have a goal on something new then? Right. So for instance, we're doing content. Even though I do content, we're building out a content team. And so the goal isn't you have to get so much traffic. 
The goal is we want you to try, I think it's like 15 pieces of content. And based on who the customer is and some other areas, they're deciding the goal, which I actually think is a really interesting way approach we can talk about. Just go experiment with a lot. And at the end of the quarter, let's be clear on how do you decide which one you want to go choose to do for content. And I think it's really nice when people can choose their own goal because then they get to choose their own motivation. Yeah, yeah. No one wants, the best people don't want to be told what to do is what I found. And people want to have creativity. And with the content, let's say what I think a lot of people do is, all right, I want you to get 10,000 views this month or I want you to get 15 followers. Okay, but are you just getting actual followers or good followers? Yeah. Right, because then their incentive is just to get clicks or views or followers or subs, but the quality might not be there. And so instead of pressuring it on the outcome of that, let's pressure on like, let's create just a lot of experiments. And at the end of the quarter, we could say, all right, based on the quality of the different things, which of this content do we want to now double down? I like that. So you create like kind of a habit target for the quarter exactly. and then you see what the outcomes are. Well, I think for goals, by the way, for everyone, have a yearly goal and then have monthly kind of, you break it down into, okay, if I need to have, let's say it's 56.6 million, each month then you just have different numbers, right? So this, yeah. and we look at it every single day. We have our own custom bot on Slack called Daily Pulse. That's like, here's how much money you needed to make today. You've seen that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let me pull it up. Let's see it. I think the big takeaway for people out there is that if you have a goal, how often are you looking at it? And if you're behind, how are you mindful of it? And if you're ahead, how are you understanding and being like, okay, I don't need to be as anxious. So Daily Pulse, we're behind. And uh, there's a cool story about this. So this month, we're supposed to hit 4.1 million net revenue. We're at 1.7 and it says red X. So the red X means we're not on track. Growth profits on track, new buyers on track, total buyers on track, AOV is off. Our VIP customers called plus members is off. And what I try to balance is not overcorrecting in the day. And I think that's so easy in small businesses to like have a pendulum to be like, okay, swing here. No, no, swing back. So Sean is in charge of revenue. I'm like, Sean, do I need to be worried about this? He's like, no, it's because we do things at the end of the month. Okay, cool. There's an owner that is looking at this and paying attention to it all the time. Right. And so it's just nice to be, for me, I'd check it, but really I'm like, well, I trust him. And that's what you'd have to do if you want to get to a business to a larger size, have people that own this stuff and then you can trust them to execute towards. Do you have a rhythm that officially you're being told about these metrics? So I, the daily pulse is every single day. So first thing in the morning, this stuff gets updated with how the numbers look. And then there's a revenue sync every single Monday at three that Sean facilitates. And it has the BI team, the finance team, marketing team, and BD team. And you all show up in live for that? Yeah, so you show up live and you're kind of breaking down like, hey, what's coming up? So like we have Sumo Day coming up or we have a last call coming up. In traffic, let's say for traffic, there's like new traffic, brand new people, and there's returning traffic. And so we separate those out to two different groups. So one person's responsible for bringing new people and one person's responsible for bringing them back. Gotcha. So like, are they on track? And more or less, it's like red, yellow, green. Yeah. And so I think what people need to ultimately get to is like, what are the, coming back to the book, Million Dollar Weekend, what are the inputs <laughs> that are, you are in control of? Right. That will then lead all the way back up to these things. Because if I want to make revenue change, I can't, there's no revenue dial. I can just go revenue dial. But what are the inputs that lead then ultimately to these three specific categories for us, traffic, conversion, AOV? So for instance, in new traffic, it's really, New traffic is like ads can be new traffic. Affiliate can be new traffic. Nick's got some other crazy ideas and he has a new traffic sales goal. So new sales. So however he really wants to get it, he can do it. Right. And if it's off, then it's like, I'm going to be a little bit more in it. But otherwise, like, all right, however you think is best to go do that, do it. What do you think about then your personal inputs relative to the company and how might you mm. take a look at that on an annual basis or a quarterly basis? For my responsibility to the company? Yeah. So the way I like to do it, and this is something that you've inspired me and I've worked on it for the past few years is around scorecard. So the company has a top three priority. And then every single leader in each department has their own top three outcomes that they're trying to do in this specific time period. So what is your scorecard cadence? Is it 90 days? We do quarter, quarter, half year. And to be clear, we're on year 15. Yeah. Year one, it was like, I don't know what's happening. Year two, it's like, I kind of know what's happening. We're improving. So what I encourage everyone is just start. And then each year, just make it a little bit better. I think people try to jump so far. I think there's one magic bullet. It's what's the right way for your own business. I feel like that's where a lot of our audience is at, Noah, is figuring out which of these tools to put in place yeah, there could be in order so to, many to help that. empower to get to that next jump, you know? And this is something that, I mean, there's still problems with it. And maybe I can address some of that. So the top three priorities of the company is new revenue, which Nick owns returning revenue, which I own because we haven't hired a VP of marketing yet. 
and then plus members, which Katie owns. And then Sean is doing the long bet. So an experimental section. So you have the scorecards of your team, executive team on your phone right now. You're just pulling it right up. Yeah, everyone in the company has this. There's no hiding. I love that. Everyone needs like, and to be clear, you don't want to be at the end of a quarter, end of a period, and both people are surprised of success. <laughs> you want both people being like, here's what you said you do. And they want to know they're successful. Everyone wants to feel success. So you need to both be very clear what it is for these people. So yeah, everyone's got their own scorecard. So there's high level metrics. I'll read it because I think it's helpful for people. So high level metrics, Sean owns all net revenue. Nick owns new buyer gross sales. I own return buyer gross sales. Sean owns net new plus customers, which are our VIP customers. And Sean owns the experimental metric. In terms of supporting metrics, there's gross profit. Because again, you don't just look at speed, right? Yeah, yeah. You, look at, you have to look at multiple dials. So supporting metrics, gross profit, your margins, conversion rate, sessions, average order value, your lifetime value to your customer acquisition costs or your marketing spend, net email signups, number of return buyers, and number of new buyers. You mentioned earlier this year that you thought the system of a scorecard was powerful enough that there could be a whole book about it. 100%. Why do you think that? What I've noticed is that people and yourself want to be, you need to think more of what's really the most important thing in the business. And then how do you make it just black and white what that destination looks like for both people? I don't think people are thinking enough what's really the priority. And I don't think they're clear on when they're actually there or not. And so the way that led to this one document, and I'll go over more of our priorities, I thought, hey, if I left from today until the end of the quarter, would the business be worse, the same or better? And to me, having this very clear scorecards for literally every single department, by the end of the quarter, I'm like, I, I'm pretty sure I could leave. There's great people at AppSumo. Shout out Alona, Kellen, Anna, Lakin, you know, Sean, Chad, Nick. Everyone knows what they're supposed to do and they helped create it. So they first see the company priority. So the AppSumo top three, as I said, new return plus in the long bet. And then knowing the top three, then they help decide themselves. And then as a group, we all kind of look at each other's priorities and then argue about them, challenge each other and then commit to them. So uh, one of the key things from Ricardo Semler, who I love his leadership style is let people choose their own destinations and make sure it's aligned to the thing you're trying to do though. Yeah. So don't just have them go totally rogue, but say, here's where I want to go. What do you think the most important things are to get there? They suggest it. Most of them are like, oh, better than I would have thought of. Let's go do those. And they're also excited because they got to choose it. I'm curious as to uh, what does leadership mean to you? What are some regular things that you do that you believe are the things of leadership? I thought about it this morning. So it's cold in Austin. And like people, a few years ago, like there's freezing and there was grocery stores were out of everything and you couldn't drive your car. And I thought about the team this morning. And then I decided to just post on our Slack group said, hey, if you need anything, can you post it here, everyone? And if you need support or if you're cold or if you need supplies, let's help each other. And leadership is either from the front or the back, directing people in a certain direction and supporting them and what they need. And so I, frankly, I was proud of myself that I said, hey, I thought about what's going on with our company in terms of specifically the team in Austin. And I took action to then make that happen. And to me, I thought, wow, this is great leadership. And that's kind of, it's a small one. It sounds kind of small, but I think that's representative of what I admire in leadership, which is people taking initiative necessarily almost without permission. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I was thinking about leadership when you were talking about all the goal setting and like getting alignment about how they're going to contribute and thinking of ways in which they can contribute to the goal. I mean, yeah, give them the autonomy. I mean, how cool, like the best people want to go be creative. Just give them the destination. I don't know who said it, but I really like the way they positioned it. It's like, your job is not to necessarily lead, it's to be an advisor. I was Joe Hudson. And I like that as a concept. Instead of me being like, you come to me and I'm the superior and I, I know things, you come to me and I'm your consultant. I'm your advisor. Let me see. And I keep working on like, how do I just support you in the things that you're trying to do? Instead of being like, here, let me tell you what to go do. What happens when you get frustrated with an employee's performance? So two days ago, <laughs> I'm doing this book thing and I have a guy, I'll just call him Tommy. And I sent him a task of working on this article for Nier. He wrote the first draft and I sent him to do it again. I said, Nier didn't like it. And I was like, can you redo it? Here's his feedback. And I gave it to him. He said, I'm at capacity. And speaking candidly, I was like, Nier, I'm at capacity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm barely sleeping. I'm not doing a good job being present for my girlfriend as much as I like and all these things. And I'm really proud of myself in that I didn't write. And 
I would say even a few years ago, no, it would have been like, you know, you're not at capacity, get to work. You would have straight up chewed them out. Yeah. No one's excited to work and being criticized. And I think one of the worst things you can do as a leader, probably the, my biggest fear as a leader is demotivating someone. But the opposite of that is the best thing you can do for a team is motivating someone. And you, you motivate through optimism. Really? Because well, you've built this incredible business though. And for most of that time, you would chew the guy out. I think it's interesting that there's a fear element to meeting a standard. Like this guy has this incredibly high standard and I could be in trouble. What I've observed is over time, how many people like being worried about their jobs? Yeah. They want to feel secure. And I have recognized that there's a lot of value in tenure. That's something that's very undiscussed in huh. companies, which is like people who really want to be there and have invested, not that they're, they're even complacent. They're just, they're invested and they want to be there and that they've stayed there a long time. I think compounds value in them being there. It's what I've observed. Like with Nick being there five, six years, Sean's been here six years and they've been able to grow. And I think they've added a lot. And like the YouTube team on the other side, and we can talk about the Tommy example, the video editor and the producer quit and the transition cost to someone new and ramping up. It was a really fascinating reminder, like how expensive it is to replace people that are wanting to be a part of it. And like, I should just pay these guys double or just whatever they would have needed to really want to stay longer. Probably been more mindful of it, but I've got enough things going on that I, I didn't prioritize that. That's really interesting. And so with Tommy, and I'll tell you a, a tactic that helped with it. I wrote this thing like, you're not at capacity. I'm at capacity. I'm Choo, choo, choo. And I didn't send it. That was the power. The power was writing it, yeah. deleting it, and then responding the next day. The next day I responded, Tommy, tell me all the things you got going on and let's see where we can prioritize my request. Presented all the things going on and I was like, just do those things and I'll, I'll take care of this. He was right. No, I could have reprioritized stuff. I'm just at a point where I, this is straight up. Like I just was like, just do those things and I'll take care of this. One. Yeah. Could I have asked him to do it? Yeah. At this point, I just need it done because I have two weeks before this book is done. Now, I think the powerful thing that I've done is every week I rate myself on my emotional consistency. Wow. So I have a Google form. Everything I do is like free. There's none of the stuff you need to buy like some expensive software or system. So every single Friday, I get the Slack bot and it says Friday weekly review. And it's just automatic. This is personal diagnostic. Yeah, this is just me. You asked about diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. And I'll get, I can give other ones that, that have worked. And so it comes to me and it says, fundamentally, my question for you is diagnostics. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you two other ones that are, are really good. So how was your week? One through five, one being sucked, five being fantastic. Any comments about that? Number two, were you consistent? One through five. And that one is the one that has changed my behavior because I just notice in meetings when I'm interacting with people, if I'm super funny and we're joking and then the next day I'm ripping you off. You know, you're pissed. Off. Yeah, like, how do you behave or how do you show up when you're not sure what you're going to get, right? And part of going to a restaurant is you want consistency. Part of working at a company. That seems like leadership to me is consistency. I mean, is what I've learned as I've gotten older. And so I want it. It's not that I don't want to be emotional. The emotion doesn't go away. Well, it's so fascinating to me because there's so many things in business that piss you off. And being pissed off is great. Yeah. Let that motivate you. But I would say don't let that make you reactive instead of being responsive. Yeah. The reactive is, Tommy, you suck. Why aren't you working harder? Just do this thing. Yeah. That's not, you think that's going to get him to want to stick around? Yeah. I would say what would have been optimal is that, Tommy, let's not do this one. I want you to take this one instead and reprioritize that stuff. And so the third question is, what are the three things I'm doing next week? And I do this every single Friday. I'm curious, are there more things like this and scorecards that you do regularly? Yeah. Other ones I like doing, I do a monthly review of my life. I've done it for about 10 years. So, wow. Yeah. Every month I do like a score of my month. So I, the first thing I do is I pull up my photos and I look through everything that happened in the month. And you're always kind of, a, it's like, holy sh**, I did, can't believe how much I did this month. But it's a cool way to kind of see what happened in the month. And then I rate my month one through 10. And it's also, you can kind of see how your mental stability is going. Because like a few years ago, it's like 10. And then it was like five. It was like all over the place. But it was nice to be able to rate that. And sometimes like this month review, because I know it's coming. I'm like, how do you want your one to be? It's not really trending well. Like, what do you want to do about it? Like, ooh. Or I'm going to rate re myself. So do I want to rip on Tommy or try to get a good score? <laughs> do both. <No. laughs> yeah, and so, the monthly thing is that. Then I, I do past, present, and future. So I take the future of the previous month, which is always bullet points, put at the top. And then I say if I did all the things I said I would do or not. And huh. it's just for myself. It's not like, again, none of this is, there's no pass fail. Right. And this is something that I like doing. Like, I miss it when I don't do it. 
then the present is everything from the photos and things that happened about how I felt, what went down, and then features what's coming up. So I do that every single month. I email it to my girlfriend, my brother, and then a few other friends. This is for me. I don't need it for anyone else. But I, I do think it's vulnerable and nice to share with people in my circle. I do that. We do two other ones in the business. One, we do a monthly leadership survey. So this is how I get better as a leader. Besides having coaches, I use Reboot.io. I send to the leadership team a survey that's, do you believe in the direction of the company one through five? Do you trust the rest of the leadership team one through five? And do you feel free to speak your mind? Is it anonymous? It's anonymous. Oh, wow. They think it's anonymous. (laughs) (laughs) Is it useful? Super useful. But the key part about it is that I encourage them, don't, it's not here to complain. It's here for you to provide a solution. Yeah. And that's also a good mentality because I want them solving problems. Don't bring me your problem. Bring me the option. And so when they're saying, hey, I don't believe in the direction. Okay, well, what about it? Don't you believe? And then each month I then show the results and the graphs of how it's been. And then one or two items that I'm going to do based on that. And I do that. Now it's every two months because every month was becoming too frequent and the scores aren't changing that much. But in the beginning, when I came back three years ago, it was like, no, it sucks. No, it doesn't get buy-in from us. No, it doesn't listen to us. What have you changed about your behavior? I try not to speak right away. I notice I do that in company where like I try to give the idea or try to respond to it right away. I'm trying to like pause for a second. I think pausing has been one of the probably best things of last year in business. I try to get more buy-in. I think there's a lot of times that, especially if you're the founder, you're like, well, I did this. I know what's right. And then just telling some other people to do it doesn't really get them excited to be a part of it. So how do you include them or even your customers in that process? So now when we do planning annually, it's like we survey the entire company about the future of the business. You can do, here's a simple framework, start, stop, keep. It's an easy one. What should we start? What should we stop? What should we keep? And survey your whole team. And then you show them like, hey, thank you. Here's how we're doing what you said. And then including the leadership team. So I'd say total buy-in. That's a nugget. I like that one. You know, one I stole from you is the Mm. monthly business review. Oh, the MBRs. Yeah, we do them now. Do you? Yeah. Those are great. On the fourth day after the month closes. Yeah. We sit down with a finance person and examine whether we're tracking the right financial metrics in the business and whether we feel they're empowering, things are healthy, unhealthy. Yeah. What did you guys notice while reading that stuff? One of the really powerful things that came away is like, well, we need to do a break-even analysis on events because we found like a a financial metric that everybody wanted to jump into was events in our business because they're a huge cost. So setting these targets months in advance for the team has been incredibly empowering for them. And what it's allowed for us, we have a small business is we never really, people, I think there's, when when you talk about things like goals, leadership, they're so big, it's easy to just have an assumption in your mind about what it is. So here's a word that we didn't take serious in our business is budget. Mm. That's a big word. You can really dig into the B word and figure out it can mean a lot of different things. Because we didn't have financial planning, it was actually impossible to have a budget. Budget in our company meant everyone's opinion right now (laughs) about a topic generally about money. That was what budget meant in our company. And now we have a budget. Good for you. Like a technical budget. I'm trying to imagine the listener, depending on where they're at, because I think a lot of your listeners are like six, seven figures, some eight. Yep. And then I'm trying to think, what's the core operate? I know there's like EOS and we've tried some of these other ones and we kind of have the AppSumo way, I would say. Yeah. So I'm trying to think like, what are the core, like in life when in America, you have a, the core four, which is like your will, your trust and a few other documents. What happens if you are sick and who makes a decision? There's like four documents. Yeah. Up. So I was trying to think in business, what are your core things you need to operate? Yeah. Well, can you think of any? Yeah. Well, I was trying to take a step back. So I think like one, having a budget is a great one. Yeah. I'd say a model. What is a model? So your budget is like, we're going to make 5 million from here. Team cost is here. Health insurance cost is this. 401k cost is that. Our net operating income target is 11.5%. Okay, did we hit our budget or not? Okay, we didn't. What do we need to change? So that's a budget. Our model though is if we want to hit this revenue target, what are the inputs, right? So how many deals we do? How many people get back? How our revenue can go day by day, right? Or month by month to see if it actually gets us to the 45 million that we need for the budget. So I would say you definitely need a model in a budget. And to be clear, there's baby steps. I feel like the early stage model is napkin math. Yeah, it's like we need to sell 45 widgets to get to our revenue. Yeah, I would say other core documents, I would say are your culture. But the way you can do your culture is actually reverse than people teach you. Do your culture like after a year of running your business. Yeah. 
and notice the behavior that's just been natural in your business. Everyone will be different, but how their business operates. Because I created the culture deck when I came back. I'm like, here's how we operate. And then people didn't want to do any of it. <laughs> but then I just noticed their behavior. What's the point of even writing it down then? What, how does the business operate when I'm not around? And so there's two types of operating manuals. There's your cultural manual, which is the behavior. And then there's your operating principles of the business. So one is in AppSumo, we hire adults. That's a huge thing. So what does that mean? Don't come and talk behind people's back. In the past, we used to have a lot of shit talking. Like, oh, God. no, we hire adults. Don't come and complain. We hire adults. If you have a problem, you can fix it. Test and invest. Huge one of our cultural values. Like, don't go and do crazy shit without testing first. So those are behavioral values. Double down. I mean, just things that ways that people operate and how you know culture matters or it's working really is that you hear people saying it. Yeah. More than, oh, as well, you'd like to see them do it, but you're like in a meeting and someone's like, hey, do you test and invest that? Okay, that's a good one. The other ones we delete. Operating principles are, what's our net operating income? And it has to be at least 10%. Yeah. If we're going to do a test, how long does a test go? How much do you spend on a test? And then what are the principles that you can have? So again, if I'm gone, people know how to behave. Like the Netflix culture deck, which is pretty mm -hmm. famous, kind of mirroring was where it inspired our two documents. That's cool. So yeah, we, I call them tenants. I think some people call them tenants. Like these are the sort of tenants that we try to achieve our goals vis-a-vis -vis the tenants. Like, I love that. Yeah, that's cool. By the way, there needs to be a book called The AppSumo Way because I do think that you guys, or, or a, a blog post, something we can get out into the world because how you guys have organically come to a way to operate There's nothing with, else like with it. a bunch of different yeah. executive minds and coaches and your board and partners, I think it's really impressive. And I've been inspired by it to come up with our own homebrew. I just think the way you talk about it too, just improve a little bit every quarter. Just add one little thing. I think a, a lot of founders are convinced of their inadequacy in this department. But like, I think yeah. the way you present it is like, it's always going to be a challenge. It's always going to be improvement. Yeah, it's, it's not going to be great. Yeah. You just keep getting a little better. I mean, easiest thing you can do in your business is every quarter, just ask people for three things they like about it and three things to improve. Call T3B3. This is what we learned from Uber. And I, we used to have like Lattice, which we paid like 20K. You can just do a Google form or like literally just do it on your notes. So like when I meet with the team, a lot of time, not almost every time I have their notes. So I have their name on my Apple notes. To I be clear, you're talking about surveying your team. Yeah. I ask them what they like about me, what they want me to improve. Yeah. I don't need to make it fancy. And a lot of times, like the last quarter was really big on like, you need to have more long-term vision. You need to have us more autonomy and trust. And then you need to do marketing. So like, okay, I'll spend more time on that. What's funny is we, a few years ago when I came back, three years ago to be CEO and I met this guy from Square and I, met all, I looked up all these people that do strategic planning. There's different Lassie and I hired a bunch of them. No one's is better than yours is what I realized. And what I mean by that is just start your system and then just be okay that it, like no one else is really better, but just stick with it and keep getting it a little bit better. And each quarter, for instance, we do project planning for the development team for all the engineers and designers. And it's just like, it's never perfect. And it's always like, okay, well, what did we learn from this time? Yep. So next year will be better. And then try to document that. Like people always say SOPs. I'm like, what the f*** is an SOP? The SOP is like the unicorn of the business world. I don't think anybody ever has used one. No, people and always <laughs> people say it. And I'm like, tell me what your SOP is. Who is he? Um, That's so what, funny. What SOP actually is, is that with our engineering thing, we have, they have a conversion rate as their main thing, let's say. Now, what are all the products they're going to do? And how do they then present them to us? And then how do we decide it? And each, I will tell you, we do it every quarter, quarter, half year. Every time we're like, that was a problem with it. Okay, let's write that down. Now, each quarter, it's getting a little better, but it's still messy. And I think that's important for people to recognize. Yeah. Any parting shots? I really like this conversation about all our system. I don't think we have a pretty organization of all of it, but I do think maybe in the future, I've thought about sharing more of it as a way of potentially even bringing attention to Hapsumo. So I like that. And I hmm. think that's for everyone. Like some of the most popular restaurants share their cookbooks. Yeah. I, always, I love that concept where it's like, just share what you're doing more and you'll be surprised like how people get excited to see that. Yeah. I'm very interested in that project because essentially that's what I've been working on. So let's continue the conversation. Okay. <laughs> Noah Kagan, congratulations on your new book and thanks for joining us on the podcast. I must. <laughs> 
Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.